I have a special connection to these readings, as I'm sure many of you do as well, because my wife and I chose the first reading in the gospel for our wedding about 36 years ago, come this Tuesday. It's easy to see why you might choose these readings from the Old Testament and the Gospel, because they really focus on the institution of marriage and the lifelong commitment that is marriage. In the context of a wedding mass, the message is direct and inspiring, affirming the permanence of marriage and the beginning of a new thing, the creation of a family. Outside the context of the wedding mass, we can miss the nuances of Jesus' message and the implication for all of us today. So let's take a look. What's happening in the gospel is the usual typical encounter in Jesus' ministry where the Pharisees are trying to get him with a notorious gotcha question. At first glance, the question seems pretty innocuous. Can a man divorce his wife? Well, divorce was allowed in Jewish culture, so that seems to be a non-question. The real question they're asking relates to two schools of thought that emerged over time from Mosaic law. We see in the next few sentences that Mosaic law permits divorce, but doesn't specify the conditions necessary for divorce. And from there comes the question of what is required. Now, there were two schools that emerged One group of rabbis held that divorce could only be um, given in an extreme reason, such as adultery. The other group held that a man could divorce his wife for virtually any reason, including burning his dinner, or more relevant to this situation, having an attraction to another woman. This debate had been going on for centuries before the Pharisees asked this question of Jesus, with both camps firmly entrenched. So the gotcha question was going to enrage some people and satisfy others, depending on how Jesus landed on it. But there's something a little bit more serious about this question. You see, Jesus was in the region that was governed by King Herod Antipas. Now you may recall that John the Baptist accused Herod of wrongfully marrying, wrongfully divorcing his wife in order to marry his brother's wife. And Herod jailed him, and eventually he was executed at the behest of Herod's new wife. So the answer that Jesus is going to give has some pretty serious implications. Now that we understand the real complexity of the question and the threat implicit in the answer, we can appreciate how Jesus responded. As in many places in the gospel, Jesus responds to the question with a question. What has Moses commanded you? It takes us back to the Mosaic law. This must have made the Pharisees extremely happy because it looked like Jesus was falling into the trap that they'd set. But when they answer, Jesus completely changes the conversation. Rather than using the Mosaic law as the beginning point of the discussion, he flips it around and uses it as the end He explains that the law of Moses was to accommodate the hardness of the human heart. But at the moment of creation, before the fall of man, God created man and woman in his image and likeness and intended marriage to be an inseparable bond. This was God's intention from the moment of creation, and the accommodation provided in Mosaic law wasn't intended to be the norm, but the exception. An accommodation shouldn't change the original blueprint that God set out from the beginning. For the Pharisees in society then and now, they are more interested in institutionalizing man's plan for himself than God's plan for us. The fact that King Herod was divorced so he could take up with his sister-in-law tells us just how prevalent and accepted this particular exception had become. The fact is, when people follow the rules of man, it gives power to man that rightfully belongs to God. But marriage is just one example of this problem. If we look around at our society today, it's pretty easy to find things that only a few decades ago would have been considered unthinkable, commonplace, and in some cases even desirable. 
See, the problem comes when we forget that we're called to a higher standard to live our lives the way God intended us to live. This doesn't preclude us making mistakes. We're human, and because of our fallen nature, we will make mistakes. But if we stop recognizing those mistakes as mistakes, we stop recognizing God's plan from the beginning for us. In many ways, we've forgotten as a society the original blueprint of creation. And this amnesia has made God's plan more difficult to live by because in some respects, it is now the exception. And even talking about it can lead to accusations of being out of step with the world, irrelevant, archaic, even dangerous. Our job is to remember that God's plan for us is for our benefit and good. And we should try to live our lives according to it as best we can. Even when we make mistakes, or especially when we make mistakes, we need to acknowledge that we're off track and get back on it, rather than throw our hands up and say, it's okay, everybody else is doing it. We have to be conscious of the struggle because, that we face, because if we, who are given the grace of God through our faith in the sacraments, still struggle... How much harder is it for those who don't have those fonts of grace? We need to be compassionate to others, especially those who have bought into the ideas of man without realizing it or without knowing that God has a plan for them. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus healed broken people regardless of their status or their history. We, too, are called to go out into the world to minister to others, especially those that are most in need to meet Jesus, regardless of what path they are currently following. Our ministry starts with compassion, not judgment. We need to remind them that they are loved by God, that they have a purpose, and that God has a plan for them, too. As always, We are strengthened by the Eucharist in this mission to be the witness and teacher of our faith. And most importantly, we need to do it joyfully, even in difficult times, because to those who are lost in the darkness of the world of man, the joy that we have from having a deep and abiding relationship with our Lord will shine out like a beacon.